alchemy. The seemingly magical process of creation. The medieval chemistry of the transformation of matter. Success stories are great, but those are not the only stories that exist. Let's dig deeper. The Alchemy Podcast. Podcast, and it partially is because of Paulo Coelho's book, *The Alchemist*. Um, but you know, also with the medieval art of transmutating any sort of copper or sulfur or bronze into gold, and I like to, you know, take that experience and apply that to everything in life. Like, just inspire young creatives, inspire mindful doers, inspire people that are out there trying to 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 do their thing. Yeah. Um, just to give everybody out there listening a little bit of a background, um, yes, we have Anna Eilensfeld here. She is an actress, singer, uh, voiceover actor, best known for her work on How to Be Single, um, the Showtime show, Our Cartoon President, and Manhattan in Love. I'm sorry, Manhattan Love Story. She attended Northwestern University. What did you study at uh, Northwestern University? Well, uh, I started off with communication studies, uh, and I told my mom I was majoring that for a couple of years, but I did transition over to theater pretty quickly. Okay. Um, and I didn't tell her that I would switched until I <laughs> had a side gig as a wedding planner, um, nice. so she felt I had a, a fallback, and she felt more comfortable with me uh, choosing the artist life. She must have been so excited to hear about it. She was freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> she was really freaked out. Well, because my mom, um, neither my mother or my father went to college. So, oh, wow. yeah. So uh, me and my sister were the first of our family to go to college. And um, for me to pursue a, a major in something like theater just didn't make any sense to her at all. I needed something practical that could become a, a very... Uh, understandable nine to five stable. career, something stable, yeah, because yeah. yeah. she because she wanted me to have a stable life, which is a really lovely thing for her to want for me. Of course, yeah. um, but unfortunately, that just wasn't the way it was going to go. Yeah, and and you know what? Luckily, you seem to have done pretty well for yourself. I mean, you have some great Broadway credits. You have Pretty Woman. You have I'm sorry, American Psycho, Kinky Boots, Wicked, and you're in Pretty Woman right now. I am, yeah. So what was your first Broadway credit that you booked? And and tell me the story about how you how you got that gig. Well, my first really big theater job that I booked was Wicked uh, doing the national tour. Wow. Um, and I was understudying Elphaba the Green Witch and her sister, Nessa Rose. Um, so I was basically always in rehearsal. And it was a huge and wonderful learning experience. And I got to see a lot of America and uh, and live in hotels. And it was right, it was before Airbnb was really happening. VRBO mm -hmm. was kind of the website to go to. So yeah. I would sometimes book, you know, different homes and just get to know communities. And so that was a really cool experience. But I told myself that that wasn't the end game and I didn't want to get stuck on the road because um, they always <laughs> – people within the theater community will joke that a show like Wicked is like – the golden handcuffs where you you get this amazing opportunity um but y the moment you leave you know you you've been spoiled and and now what are you supposed to do yeah um and i didn't want to get caught in that trap and i didn't want to feel handcuffed to a job at, at a young age so i told myself i was only going to do a year and i gave them if you gave 11 weeks notice you get you got like a couple thousand dollars bonus and i was mm -hmm. like great i'm doing 11 weeks i wrote my letter i gave 11 weeks and everyone's like wait what are you leaving for what are you going to do i was like I don't know. It's just <laughs> what I said I was going to do a year ago. So mm -hmm. here I am doing it. And I just hoped that things would work out. Um, and about four weeks before I left that tour, I got a call on my phone from a 212 number. And my friend was in the car with me. And she's like, oh, I bet it's Broadway calling because that's always the joke. But it was Broadway calling. Yeah. And it was the Wicked Company of Broadway asking if I would want to come in and do a vacation cover for a couple weeks on Broadway. Um, and I said yes. And so I got back to the city um, a c four weeks later had uh, one week to settle in and then was immediately on Broadway. And I made my debut um, the same night as two other actors and the Wicked Company, and they don't usually do this. It was very special. They all signed a card for me um, that had a picture of the, the Broadway like street sign on it. Yeah. And the entire company saw signed it and said, you know, welcome to the company. Because in an old running show, in a long running show like that, you know, when people people get replaced all the time, it's not celebrated. But because they had three people, they decided to make a thing of it. And they gave us a little bottle of champagne. So it was actually a really special Broadway debut. Um, 
And the funniest part for me is that while I was covering Elphaba, it's not like I was doing it. I was the um, uh, an understudy, so you do other stuff on stage and ensemble work. And th- what I had to do that night was actually the one track in the show that has, like, clown shoes. <laughs> They're, like, <laughs> twice my size on my foot. Yeah. And you have to, like, run. And you're wearing this thing, um, this huge costume with this head part that actually extends up like a puppet it goes like five oh feet in the air above your actual head so you yeah. can't see because like this huge sock suddenly went over your head yeah and the puppet head is five feet over your head and then you have to like twirl it around and then you have to slam it back down so it's back on top of your head and you can kind of see through it <laughs> oh and then you God. turn and then you hobble off stage in these clown shoes and before i went out one of the dance captains was like now just be careful because if you travel down onto the lower level of stage you can get stuck Oh you won't God. make it off stage. We had that happen to a girl once, and she kept on trying to like find the ledge to step up on, but in these huge shoes, she just couldn't do it. So she eventually just sat down on stage. The stage manager had to go get her. I was like, <laughs> thanks. Guess I'll go out there and make my Broadway debut in these clown shoes now. <laughs> but it didn't happen, thank God. Um, but that was actually that was my my Broadway debut, and I was with Wicked off and on for that entire year. That's incredible. It was. It was also a really – uh, educational experience because I was a vacation cover and an, an emergency cover because the role of Elphaba is really demanding. It's probably mm-hmm. one of the most difficult female roles, not, not, I mean female or male roles, honestly, in musical theater. It's a long show. You're singing these crazy songs. And the thing you don't know until you're in the part is that you're also Dan- running around backstage, yeah. going up and down these ladders, flying in the air. <sighs> it's nuts. Yeah. But it's exhilarating. But it's nuts. Um, and so these women, there's so many things that can go wrong. I mean, hopefully you're vocally healthy, right? Yeah. Um, hopefully you don't get sick, but you could just get like a typical flu or you could, you know, trip going down the stairs and roll your ankle or like on stage, like, I don't know, something hits you in the head and you're out. Like it happens. Um, and even though there's coverage within the company already, you can sometimes fly through women. They'll drop like flies, especially if it's a flu season Mm -hmm. and then you don't have anybody. So, um. I would get these phone calls. Like, I got one phone call um, when I wasn't working at the time with Wicked. And um, I had just stayed out till 4 a.m. with my friends because I hadn't seen them because I was on tour for a year. And we're like, let's go out like we're in college. So we're out till 4. <laughs> I just crash at their place at, at, and, like, wake up the next morning to an 11 a.m. phone call. And I, I pick it up. And it's my agents. Like, hey, so Wicked wants to know if you can be there today for the matinee. Oh, my God. And I'm, like, maybe still drunk but definitely hungover. And I was yeah. just like, yeah, I'll be there. And I, like, <laughs> go get a Jeez. bagel sandwich and some – cups of coffee and go to the I, Gershwin I mean, and pray that the Elf on stage doesn't go down. Shit, I mean, that's the <laughs> reputation of musical theater people. They are like warriors. Yeah, yeah, you, you like, gotta be. You gotta be able to dance, you gotta be able to sing, you gotta be able to act, and you gotta be able to do it. I mean, like, the turnaround for certain actors if you're going out for pilots sometimes is like 10 pages overnight, right? Which is nuts. But you have that as a, as a musical theater person and you have, like, three songs that you gotta have and you gotta be able to dance also, right? Yeah. Jeez. Um, <laughs> yeah. Any, <laughs> just for <laughs> the sake of looking back in retrospect and surviving the experience, do you have any like any huge failures looking back that you like? Oh I'm glad God. I I'm glad I went through that, or some that you learned from from that 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 failure, or or just that that brush of of just near death experience and yeah. Probably. Well, losing my voice. I, yeah. Uh, that we were kind of talking about that, but yeah. I had, um, and actors don't talk about this on Broadway because for a long time, um, it's been shamed. If you get a vocal injury, um, people look at you and say, well, why are you singing wrong? Mm-hmm. But actually, what what it is is that um, vocally, um, Broadway performers, not only are they singing very difficult scores, but they're doing it eight shows a week. Uh, even some touring artists don't sing that much, yeah, right? Yeah. And their shows are only an hour <laughs> and a half long. Our shows, our shows can be over two hours long, maybe up to three hours long. So um, you're talking about the Olympics of vocals here. Mm-hmm. And people get injured in the Olympics all the time. I'm a big sports fan. I love the Eagles, right? I'm always watching football. And and I play fantasy football. Right. And every week, <laughs> you're just like, all right, which running back is it going to be this week? Which one's going to go down? Do yeah. I have their backup? Who's got their handcuff? And it's expected. But for some reason, we don't 
treat our vocal artists that way. Mm. We think that they're supposed to be resilient. And the truth of it is most vocal artists have injuries. I mean, Adele had a massive injury. Yeah. She had to get, I think she hemorrhaged. Sam um, Smith too. Right? Sam Smith. I mean, uh, Julie Andrews, mm. who we all know, ha everyone, you don't have to be a, a vocalist to know she has amazing technique. Yeah. She had a vocal injury. It just happens. It's part mm. of the terrain. So um, you can make it worse for yourself 100%, which is what I did. Yeah. I um, I had a terrible vocal injury because um, I had been working so much, which is, of course, a blessing. But when you're singing um, stuff that's in the rafters and you're belting all that time, uh, it can be really demanding. And if you're not taking care of yourself, which I wasn't, um, you can you can start to have problems. And for, for all the people that out there that don't know what taking care of yourself means as far as like doing vocals, what does that mean to take care of yourself? It's different for everybody. Um, and I think it, you have to do more things the older you get. Mm -hmm. um, when I was younger, I mean, taking care of myself was like, okay, I guess I have to leave the bar by one. Mm -hmm. but, like, <laughs> <laughs> but now it's like, okay, I'm not drinking during this entire show, yeah. uh, which means a year. And uh, I should probably be working out and I should really stay away from uh, in uh, inflammatories and uh, dairy because that causes mm. mucus. You know, you, you yeah, think about yeah. these, like all these, and I guess I need to neti pot and I guess I should steam and, uh, you know, so I, um, I was, I had a, a huge breakup in my life. It was like a five-year relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I just changed jobs to work at uh, Kinky Boots and um, I had a flu hit me I had the breakup hit me and um I was I was at my friend's wedding so I was drinking a lot and then I I drove back into town and I thought it was a good idea to go right back into my show and it just felt vocally weird mm. um so I was doing the wrong things to take care of myself number one number two I didn't trust my intuition I I thought that um kind of like a lot of athletes well I can push through this right yeah try to push through it after a week I realized that like Something was off, and I was even having issues like phonating on certain notes. So I would go to sing, and there'd be nothing. Mm -hmm. That's bad. That's a really bad sign. Um, like so when you say that there was nothing, there was like a little bit of a voice, or there was just no voice, nothing at all. No voice. Holy shit. No voice. Yeah. For a single note. So, you know, you're playing your instrument, you get to this one string, and suddenly you realize the string isn't there. Yeah. Um, horrifying. So I went to a ENT, an ear, nose, and throat specialist. Mm -hmm. And um, it was one I hadn't been to before, and he didn't specialize in singers, mistake number three. I just went to a regular ODNT. So he did, um, what they'll do is they'll scope your throat, so they get a little like camera on the back of your throat. It goes all the way back, and they just take a picture of your vocal cords. It's nuts. I've seen so Sounds many pictures of my vocal cords. Comforting. It's crazy. <laughs> Fun fact about your vocal cords, looks like a woman's vagina. <laughs> so you'll be like on the subway looking at like the pictures from your ENT, and suddenly you're like, everyone thinks I'm looking at She's a really yeah. up close picture of vagina right now. Just vocal cords. Um, so uh, he didn't get a good shot of it, and he like a lot of people do assume that I was just making something up in my head because I'm a crazy woman or um, I was singing incorrectly. So he sent yeah. me to a new, vo uh, new voice teacher. So I went to this voice teacher and he was this crazy guy. He like, he was very operatic and like, he just like, by the end of the lesson was like, he's like, can I just make a physical adjustment? I was like, sure. He grabbed my <sighs> chin and the back of my head and was like swinging it this way and that way and back and forth and was telling me to sing on these weird vowels. And I was like, this is, this is wrong. So again, my gut was like, this is wrong. So I went to a different ENT because I was like, I don't trust this guy. The second guy I went to was this really holistic guy who doesn't mm. like to use steroids. A lot of singers will use steroids to push through, which ends up being a big mistake because you can do anything on steroids, but you can't because it's a delicate instrument and you end up hurting yourself yeah, even more. recovery time. It's bad. It's a bad yeah. idea. Um, but sometimes you have to do it. But um, So I went to a guy who was anti those things. And he, even with the pictures of my cords, like mm -hmm. I was saying, he scoped me, took the pictures of my cords, didn't see anything wrong. And he was like, I think you just have like you have post-nasal drip, like push through. So I'm still in my show. I haven't left the show yet. I'm still seeing this stuff and it still doesn't feel right. And it gets finally to the point where there's like three notes I can't sing. Mm. And this is about a month after the initial guy. And I was like, I need to go to somebody else. Went to new ENT. He looked at my cords and immediately was like, oh, you have pseudocysts. I was like, well, that sounds horrifying. What are <laughs> pseudocysts? He was like, pseudocysts are blisters, basically, uh. on your vocal cords. And I didn't have one. I had two. And they were directly across from each other. Oh, my God. So when your cords, when you phonate, your cords come entirely, they, they get entirely together and they, they touch each other. Mm -hmm. And um, they vibrate together. 
and that's how you make noise. But because I had these two blisters, my cords couldn't even touch. There was like a big gap between the two of them because these blisters were touching before my cords were touching. So that's why I couldn't phonate on certain notes because wow. that where my cords hit it's was where those, that the noise for those notes were, pr- were produced. Gotcha. So um, what I had to do was um, I continued in the show because I didn't want to lose money. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had to immediately start going to speech therapy to try to get the pseudocysts to go down in size because like a blister, they were full of fluid and you can kind of drain it if you're smart about how you're producing sound. How would you drain that? I don't know. Your body is incredible and it naturally will do certain things, but basically just by not adding added pressure to your cords. So okay. so I had to stop talking to a lot of people. Yeah. I had to stop staying out late. I really, all I could do was wake up, warm up, stay quiet, do my show, go to bed, and um, go to my speech therapy. And so I, um, if, if you actually see my episode of Manhattan Love Story, it's right when I'm in the middle of my speech therapy. So I speak very well. I'm speaking yeah, on yeah. my voice the whole time. Yeah, Christine would be so proud of me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, with that work, I was able to get one of the blisters, the pseudocyst, to go away actually mm-hmm. on the cord, but the other one didn't change in size at all. So after three months, I was in that predicament, and I said, all right, fine, go ahead with the surgery. The surgery was terrifying because they have to tell you before you go under that there's a chance, a small chance, but there's a chance that you won't sing again. Yeah, wow. So that's why I delayed it for as long as I did because singing was my identification. So just to backtrack, you yeah. know, you, you went to – you you were studying something different in college. You decided to change and go into theater. You did you know you had a voice like this when you were younger or no? I did. Yeah, I've always done theater. Um, it was always saw seen as a hobby though. So you finally decided to take that leap and to do something that you love, and then you have this crisis of uh, the cyst in your vocal cords, and then now you're faced with something that you may never be able to sing again even though you're you're living your dream and you're in these amazing shows and you have all these amazing opportunities. Yes. Correct? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> no, that's that's a great story. Oh, it's horror. It, it is. It's a great story. Yeah. And it's when you're in that situation, it's devastating. And here is, the, here is uh, another part I didn't tell you was that, so I went and I did have the surgery. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, t- a little tangent, hor- horrifying when you walk in i was like so cool i was like it's fine i'm gonna be in and out it's gonna be great we're gonna be good i'm down for this whatever i even show up like the hospital my friends there to like drive me back to my place after just in case i have to go under i was like we're gonna be great we're gonna roll we're gonna be in we're gonna be out it's gonna be awesome and then suddenly you're in the gown and you walk into this all white operating room and there's the table that you have to put yourself on mm. to go into surgery and suddenly i was like five years old just like looking for my mom i was like this is horrifying i don't want to yeah. do this yeah. luckily i had an amazing doctor and the surgery uh, we went very well mm-hmm. but you still you're not from that moment for until like a week later you are not allowed to talk so you're not allowed to see what voice you have and if you do try you might ruin your voice so, yeah. so you have to <coughs> sit with yourself and what just happened for a week makes me clear my throat right now <laughs> <I was> just <laughs> like <coughs> just yeah so that's when I went. I went upstate for a week and stayed with a, a lovely bed and breakfast. And I had my little notebook where I wrote down my, uh, you know, food orders. And yeah. it was actually a, that was a really fun part of it because people, <laughs> you don't encounter someone with, with a vocal injury very often. Yeah. Um. So I had a. I printed out a little bit of computer paper and on it I said. Um, I have a vocal, I'm on vocal rest and cannot talk. Yeah. And I just taped it on the front of my notebook to save me the having to write that over and over and over again. So I would just flash it to people. I'd be nice. like, I have a vocal injury and can't talk. So I went to the gas station. I was like, I have a vocal injury and can't talk. And Did I was people just like, think you were messing with them? No, people are actually, they really want to help you. Yeah, yeah. So when I was at the gas station, the guy was like, oh, he just, he mutely nodded to me, yeah. reached through the window and grabbed my notebook and wrote down what kind Aww. of gas do you want? And I was like, no, 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 I can hear you. I had to like gesture <laughs> like, no, I hear, I just can't talk. Yeah. I had one waiter try to act out the whole menu for me, all of the specials. And I was like, no, 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 I can. I can it's I different. Can, I can understand you, but. You can yeah. still talk. I can't talk. <laughs> But people really wanted to communicate, which was kind oh of beautiful to see, honestly. Oh my God. Um, but luckily for me, a week later, went to the ENT. Chords looked amazing. Great. And um, then I had a year long, a year long process to get my voice back to the to a, a place that I was happy with. Great. Um, and it was uh, 
very hard to, you know, go out. Very hard to, I couldn't go to bars that were loud, so I couldn't go to bars. Um, <laughs> very hard to, like, date. I was trying to date at that time. A lot of guys didn't understand it. I, mm. This one guy just, like, kept on trying to smoke pot around me. And I was like, I don't, under, I don't know how many times I have to tell you, like, I can't, first of all, like, no. And second of all, like, why would you think smoke is something to be around? And then he would be like, okay, let's just go to this bar. And I go to this, like, loud bar. And I was like, I can't be here right now. Like, yeah. I just, it was nuts. Um, but, my, you know, and, and, and I was still working on Broadway. I, got, I, I went back um, to working with Kinky Boots. So I had to also sing at that Olympic level right yeah. off of that injury. I had, I had three months to get my voice, two months to get my voice back in shape and then get back into the show. Um, and then I, you know, it, it, it was another year. It took, honestly, it took a year for me to feel good about my voice again. Um, but having lost it and having had to examine who I was without my voice, it made me write my first short film. That's great. Yeah. And the short film is about, you were telling me the... Well, but my first short film that I wrote was, uh, I had a bunch of friends when they hit their early, uh, their late 20s, just up and leave the city. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know why. And um, I felt like maybe there was something wrong with me for wanting to stay. Um, and I wanted to explore it. So I wrote this piece uh, called Blue Halloween. Um, about a, a woman who was very successful and a young woman and um, but had no skills to, to be social because she worked so hard cultivating her career. She didn't spend any time cultivating relationships. And here she was at a place where she was happy in her career. And so she wanted to have the guy too yeah. and just didn't couldn't, know to... didn't know how to do it. And she ends up um, meeting this bartender who is, you know, gruff and seen it all in the New York scene who kind of helps her out. Um, and it was a really fun piece. I got to do it with my very good friend, Danny Sherman, who's an incredibly talented actor. I met him during Kinky Boots, but he's worked on, on countless television shows. And, um, and it was a great learning experience. And it was a wonderful way for me to show that I'm more than just my singing voice. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a voice beyond that. I think you're a great storyteller because that's not even the film that I was talking about. I know. <laughs> that's not even... <laughs> I wasn't even talking about that one. I was talking about the other one. <laughs> I know, but which I, I haven't like, written oh, yet. Oh, okay. Well, can you talk about that one that you haven't written yet? Because that's a great story, too. Yeah. So when I was upstate and I was, um, I call it my convalescence upstate, when I was recovering from my vocal injury, I, um, I love hiking and um, I wanted to be in nature. I thought that'd be mm -hmm. very healing. And I went on lots of wonderful hikes and saw these beautiful people and these dogs and nature and it was just lovely. Um, and then one day I went on one hike and now, you know, I can't talk and I'm, you know, a woman upstate by myself and, um, I went on a hike on a path that seemed really like safe and paved and pretty yeah. boring, honestly. Um, and I, you know, saw some people along the way and eventually got to a point where it was kind of just me by myself. And, uh, that was when this biker, this guy who was like a little shady, like approached me on his bike and he got to where I was and then he went and did a little circle around me. Like a vulture, but on a bicycle. Yes. Got it. And, it, yeah. and then drove by me after having like, I fucked the shit out of me that whole time. And I was immediately, immediately made aware of the fact that I was a woman alone in the woods and I couldn't talk. Mm -hmm. And there was this creepy guy on this bike. And I kind of turned around to see what was happening with him just in time to see him jet off the trail and kind of like go into the bushes. Um, and that was a couple yards behind me, which is right before where my car was, where I had to turn back around to walk back down this trail to get to my car. And I didn't want to figure out if he was waiting for me or mm -hmm. just kind of taking his own little trail. Yeah. Um, he seemed menacing enough that I was scared. So I actually immediately like turned to my right into the woods on the opposite side of the trail and just hightailed it to the highway and went south on the highway back to my car and, and just drove out of there. Um, and it freaked me out and it, uh, it made me feel very small and insignificant and, um, and in a way that I, that kind of ruined all of the empowering, beautiful nature hikes I had before. And it, it kind of made me think about how um, women feel in general uh, a lot of the time when they, they don't have a voice and or their voice is taken away from them and they're put in a situation like that um, with either you know a man or just a, a circumstance that seems out of their control. And uh, it's definitely a story I want to explore. Mm -hmm. um, 
and and write something about. I feel like it's double fold a little bit, you know. It's like someone who identifies with kind of like what they find to be their superpower, right? Yeah. Your voice, because like you put it, you're singing at an Olympic level, which is an, another great way to put it. And then that thing that you have so much of an identity and so much of a strength in is taken away from you. Yeah, correct. And, and yeah, go ahead. and that's very vulnerable in itself. Yeah. Um, because yeah, yeah. you're not sure if you're ever going to get it back. Mm -hmm. Um, and you are hit with the harsh reality that, you know, there are healthier, younger girls right behind you want to take your, your spot. So, yeah, you know, yeah. you got to get back up to that level or else it's done. Absolutely. That's the other thing, too. Even if you did get your voice back, who's to say you're going to be able to sing the way you could? Because my specialty, if you know me and you know the parts that I sing, um, they are very powerful, strong, loud, high belting women. Wow. And... If I can't do that, then I can't do what people expect me to do, um, which isn't always a bad thing, but mm -hmm. it is a scary thing, uh, and it is and it is a new thing to grapple with. It's just like getting um, pigeonholed or stereotyped into a certain category, mm -hmm. a certain a certain part you always play. Um, you know, some people get to the point where they're like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. But what if you get to this part in your career where you get an injury and suddenly you can't do it anymore? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so you don't even get to like grunt and be mad while you like begrudgingly take that role you can't take that role anymore at all yeah um it's horrifying it's yeah. a horrifying feeling but from that place is great growth mm -hmm. because you realize that you are actually bigger than your voice you are more than just a singer you are more than just an actor you're more than just a writer mm -hmm. you are anna eilensfeld you can do what anna eilensfeld does and i think that you have a really um, you have so much potential as, as a writer or a storyteller because these are like, these are things that I would watch. You know what I mean? Like that's all great. the things that you mentioned are, these are stories that I would watch and I'd be like, wow, that's pretty amazing. Reminds me of like a, like a Brit Marling type of thing. You ever, you ever watch the OA? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like that kind of thing. Yeah. That kind of theme of like hope and finding strength in your vulnerability, like that kind of theme. I, I really dig that kind of th stuff. Yeah. Um. So how long after your your vocal injury did you uh, did you audition for Pretty Woman? So there, you know what? I actually had about a year with Kinky Boots to get myself back on track vocally. Mm -hmm. um, then, uh, I, and while I was doing that, I was able actually to book a bunch of television parts, which was wonderful. Then I left Kinky Boots to do American Psycho, oh. Oh. Um, which I booked in about three days. Wow which is the fastest I've ever booked a Broadway show. <laughs> mm. And I think a lot of people would, would agree. Uh, they That project came really fast to me. I think I was auditioning for someone, for a part that someone had already been cast at, but then had to drop out. I went to the dance call, <laughs> which, you know, listen, I'm a good mover. Yeah, Which yeah. is what we call, if you're not like a dancer on Broadway, you say, yeah. I'm a mover. <laughs> and I would even say I'm a very good mover, but yeah. I am not a dancer, okay? Yeah. There are some people on Broadway who are in incredible at what they do when it comes to dance yeah and i went to this dance call which is immediately like you know the pit falls out of your stomach and you're like oh god oh god oh god so i get there and there's every single amazing dancer on broadway there like these women are incredible <laughs> and me and then you better believe i called my agents i was like what the hell am i doing yeah, here yeah, yeah. i was like everyone from Gigi, everyone from like american dress which are ballet shows are yeah. here and me <laughs> i was Shit. like someone's wrong they're like no 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 casting said you should be there they said this is a dance hall for you i was like god damn it okay fine fine so i'm like okay well i'm gonna walk in there i'm gonna act i'm gonna act the shit out of this choreography because <laughs> that's that's what i'm gonna offer turned out that it was very athletic and like <clears throat> and like 90s hip hop -y kind yeah. of choreography which actually is kind of my wheelhouse i discovered there you go and there was even one part of the audition which people still mock this to this day where they played um oh god what's that song uh, i'm a freak i'm a loser mm -hmm. you know that song it's like grungy like 90s mm -hmm. um and we're like okay here's the scenario it's like the red light district and you are selling your wares to this song so all the girls <laughs> go up against the wall go and you had to improvise the dance and ah. these women have like legs above their head, yeah. like all these turns and things. I'm like, okay, I don't have that, but I do have a mean like grunge stare. Okay. So there was like one producer from the show sitting in front of me. So I just <laughs> stared him down, like went like into like a deep squat, and, like, <laughs> like, was just, like 
<laughs> really nasty. And he was so into it. And I booked the job. There you go. <laughs> there you go. That's amazing. <laughs> so you can be in a room full of the best dancers in the world at a dance call and still book it over them. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> that's that's incredible. So you're, you're So that was American Psycho. Sorry, you asked sorry, I yeah. went off. You asked me about Pretty Woman. <laughs> Pretty Woman I had been working on for a long time. Um in, in development. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. We're getting all of it. We're going everywhere. <laughs> Let's go. I totally was like, I, yeah, I know you want to talk about Pretty Woman, but I want to talk about American Psycho. Um, sorry. No, no worries. <laughs> um, sorry. So Pretty Woman is the same creative team from Kinky Boots. They had me working on it for a year and a half before it even started uh, being on its feet uh, as a production. Um, so I'd always been a part of the process. I actually didn't audition for it. It was an offer. Mm -hmm. Finally, I got an offer. I there you go. Finally got there. Um so yeah, I've been I've been working on Pretty Woman actually for three years, even though it's only on, been on Broadway for about ten months. It's incredible, and you're playing two different roles, yeah. Yeah. So every night I get my own song, which Brian Adams wrote for me. So nice very of nice, him. Very um, nice. It's a jazz standard actually, which is cool. Um, and that's for if you're familiar with the film. Mm -hmm. There's a scene where uh, the Julie Roberts character goes to a fancy dinner with Edward and has to eat escargot and the snails go flying. We could not do that on stage. So I instead we <laughs> yeah, right? that would get a little messy. So we had to musicalize it and make it a dance number. Mm -hmm. And I am the vocalist for that. So I do that. And then I also play Edward's ex girlfriend, mm -hmm. Susan, who uh she comes in two scenes and she's like upper crust and she's cold and she's a little bitchy. But they like have like a bit of a friendship still, but uh She's a part of his old world. I heard that, um, and it, correct me if I'm wrong. I heard uh, Julia Roberts came into one of the shows and she she gave like kind of like a stamp of approval or she 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 loved what you guys were doing. Yeah. Care to elaborate on that? Correct. She me? came and saw the show and she was just like beaming from the house. She's got that killer smile. Came backstage was so lovely to everybody. Uh, no one told. So Sam is playing that part. Sam Samantha Barks. Yeah. Uh, and no one told her that she was in the audience. So the first time she knew she was there was when she came backstage, and it was just like very exciting to That's see. Incredible. Yeah, Sorry. and um, she was lovely, and she gave she made sure she gave everyone a hug and said she loved the show and appreciated all of us. So that was really really cool to meet her. It's huge. Yeah. So going like you you have such a dope story like going from not doing acting your entire entire life like to doing it in college, doing singing and getting a like recovering from a vocal injury and being in one of Broadway's great, great shows right now, new hot shows, and to continuing that journey and writing your own story, it's 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 amazing. It's oh, inspiring. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I just, um, I've always loved musical theater. Um, if you know anything about musical theater, I'm kind of like a Sondheim purist. Mm -hmm. um, do you know Stephen Sondheim? He did, you know, I do. You know Into the Woods? That yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like the, the quintessential high school musical show. Yeah. Um, he's got a lot of amazing works, and he wrote, like, all these really interesting, crazy characters. And uh, I actually went to a high school. So I, I did musical theater in high school along with, you know, swimming and softball and soccer and all these things. I was always doing stuff. But um, my – so I did only – Stephen Sondheim Productions, because our um, music director just insisted on it. He mm -hmm. was like a, a deep brooding soul, and he was like, "We're only doing Sondheim." <laughs> it's like, okay. Um, so we did, you know, we did into the woods like three times while I was there. Um, and then my senior year, we actually did Sweeney Todd, mm. uh, which is the story where the um, barber um, kills people. And his associate, Mrs. Lovett, bakes them into pies, and then they sell the meat pies to the population. Great. And I played Mrs. Lovett. <laughs> <And> I was <laughs> like, really, I had, I had a blast playing this disturbed character. So I, I've just always loved it, and um, I never thought I could make a career of it. I always thought that was like some sort of like, that was like on par with seeing a unicorn, like actually getting mm -hmm. to be an actor. Um, so I, you know, I kind of had to make it up as I went, um, uh, which which is fun because it let me. It, it still gives me the attitude of like, well, then why don't I keep on making it up? Why don't I go into voiceover and do cartoons? Yeah. Why don't I go and do commercials and be like, you know, the face of Crest for a year and yeah. like, you know, why don't I flip the switch and start writing and why don't I look into direction and just 
keep the creative juices going just go where things uh, take you and say say yes to the opportunities that come your way absolutely um you don't know what you're capable of until you you try something you know mm -hmm. that's amazing yeah. i you, you've made my job so easy <laughs> here. no you're a great storyteller in all in all ways and i love it um how can the people out there keep up with you? How can we keep up with your journey? I'm really active on Instagram, actually. Nice. Um, my handle is my name, Anna Eilensfeld. My last name is uh, E-I-L-I-N-S-F-E-L-D. Um, <laughs> but if you put in Anna, E-I-L, I'll pop up. There's not many of us. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I'm on Facebook, but I'm not as active. I'm on Twitter, but um, that seems to be, like, not what the young folks do these days. Mm. Um snapchatting i don't snapchat i just i got a new phone for my birthday nice. it's in march so i just had to download snapchat because march I what it. uh 18th oh we're a few days apart march 22nd is my birthday but you're not a pisces i'm not a pisces you're an aries thank god we're both on the cusp though <laughs> what do you mean thank god i'm not a pisces how dare very you very sensitive people i hear no. no my brother is a pisces what do you mean sensitive? <laughs> see we're see what i'm sensitive? saying do i didn't want to bring this? it up i didn't want to bring it up see that um no but my brother's a pisces and we we <laughs> oh well then that's you don't bring your brother baggage into the to astrology how dare I couldn't, you i couldn't help i couldn't help but bring <laughs> my brother baggage into it my but, sister's a leo so i just like really don't understand her like, what is going on with you ever why aren't you why aren't you feeling things <laughs> Two almost opposites, huh? Yeah, I think actually my dad is is actually my exact. He's a Virgo, um, which September. I think that's he's actually in my company right now. I do have my exact opposite. She is September eighteenth, oh. and I am March eighteenth. And I feel like we very much balance each other out. Opposites attract. We do. We opposites get along. Attract. Yeah, She's yeah. awesome. 